A nine-year-old girl abducted as she got off the school bus just blocks from her home. People have waited a long time to see someone charged in this murder standing in a courtroom. Then if we walk, this is a parking structure here. The bottom section completely closed off, completely flooded. The entire structure now closed. They're finding bullet holes actually in their front door. There's one in this white door here. I'm standing along Highway 94 here. You can see no cars are coming. Now the water hasn't reached over the highway yet, but look at this. This is how close it is. This is what people are concerned about. You know, the house behind me, this is the one that we're looking at. I'm gonna step out of the way so you can get a good look at this here. Because I was just able to talk to the public information officer with Maryland Heights. She tells me that an officer was shot here. He was taken to the hospital. He is in stable condition. Officers here from the North County Cooperative were just at that market a little over a week ago. Hopefully this parking lot's going to be packed later tonight. That's because this is one of nine restaurants that's donating their proceeds to the family of Officer Langsdorf tonight. This, where I'm standing, is run over from the Mississippi River. And really, this is the visual I want you guys to see. Water from the Mississippi already breaching the levee here in Winfield. I'm along Main Street here in Grafton, and I've got to show you this. Behind me is a nice man. He's got to take a boat to work this morning. You know, I, I didn't even mess with the hair today. It is that humid out here. I have a great humidity hairspray not worth even bothering. I'll take a quote out of my mother's book and she says, if you stand out too long in this humidity and today's one of those days, you're going to just look wilted. Yeah, we're kind of at the end of the parade route here. Yeah. So we've got a while until the parade gets to us. We got, now that we're in position here on the front of your car, what is going on? What is this like? Yeah, you know, I'm just here casually jamming out to some Gloria. I think a lot of people are this morning. Yeah, Margie, I'm along the Mississippi here. Now, I want to give you a, an idea of how high this water is. I think this tree represents it pretty well. You can see that's a big tree. The water is a good ways up the tree here. Now, the river is supposed to crest in this area this weekend. It's supposed to crest at about 37 feet. And if you walk with me across the road here, you can get another idea of just how much water is in this area of Winfield and along the Mississippi. So 37 feet is the crest, 37.2. It's the biggest crest they've had in 11 years. And here's the problem. Their levee only holds about 35 and a half feet of water. So that's really the concern here in Winfield. Now they are sandbagging this morning. We tried to get, get to that area. We couldn't even get there because there was already some water over that road. So we're gonna get a ride with the fire department a little bit later. The sandbagging though happening at 7 a.m. If you wanna be a part of it, you're supposed to meet at the Winfield Foley Fire Protection District Station 1, 7 a.m. Then you will be shuttled over to the area where they're doing that sandbagging. Now people are sandbagging to either cover their homes, their businesses, and as part of the levee here, because like I said, they know there are spots where the levee won't hold up. So they're gonna work, they're gonna put out some sandbags to try and hold that area, asking for volunteers out here this morning. Like we said, this will be the biggest crest that they've seen here in 11 years. So there is some concern. Water already very high. A lot of roads that we started down had to either reverse out of or try to turn around. So just be careful if you are in this area already. I'll send it back to you in studio. Good morning, Margie. You know, police don't know how fast this car was going when it hit the bank, but when we're looking at the damage here, you can only imagine. I'm going to step out of the way. Caddy corner here from where I'm standing is the car and the bank that we're talking about. Look at the damage to that car and look at the bank. I mean, we're talking about a brick building that's split apart that you can kind of see inside of now. Now, this is along Limburg and Rot Road. We also have some video of it from the damage to the vehicle. Police tell us that the driver did not survive the crash. Now this all happened a little bit before 3 a.m. According to Sunset Hills Police Sergeant Robbie Hagen, an officer spotted a vehicle behind buildings in an industrial area on Old Gravoy. Now Hagen says that they've had a lot of thefts in that area, so the officer tried to stop the vehicle. That's when the driver took off. Hagen says the driver went up Old Gravoy to Highway 30 and then Highway 30 to Limburg. She says that the car was driving erratically and the officer actually lost sight of the vehicle. Then when it, the officer turned on to Limburg, he saw that the vehicle had crashed into that BMO bank on the corner there. Now the driver again is deceased. We all know that phrase that there are heroes among us and that could not be more apparent than in sitting down and talking with the Wirtz family.
I have been in Cambodia a week now, and my buddy and I are going to take a ride on the dirt bikes. Scott Wartz's buddy parents, and Dave and Fran, read through emails from Scott over the years. Dad needs to just stop drinking soda and we'll be good to go. He needs to start drinking Propel. It has a sweet taste to it. Plus, if he was quitting for Lent, just tell him Jesus would be mad if he catches him cheating. Dave and Fran, Scott's second mom, worried that deployments and war would change Scott's big, funny, outgoing personality. But it didn't. Starting school at All Souls and then moving to St. Richard's, Scott tried every sport, even skateboarding. He was still a skater dude, and he had the hair, and Tony Hawk was his idol. Scott played football at DeSmet during high school and after high school went on to wash windows at sports arenas. He was an adrenaline junkie. So it didn't surprise Dave and Fran when Scott joined the Navy and became a Navy SEAL. He was determined he was not going to fail. Yeah. That, that was not an option. Scott didn't fail. As a SEAL for eight years, at times he couldn't tell his parents where he was or what he was doing but he did tell them about his fellow SEALs. Scott never had any biological siblings, but he's probably got more brothers than you know, anybody. Deployments were the norm for the Wirtz. I got all the uh, fun stuff to do, the fun mother stuff. Help me with my bills and call this person. To... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Can you yeah. take care of this for me? Can you fax this? Can you, you know, send money here? And which is fine, that's what, you know, that's what you do. In 2005, Scott retired from the SEALs. Within just a few days, government agencies were asking him to do contract work. And since he now had a little bit more downtime, Scott got into spear fishing and MMA fighting. One day he met and became friends with his favorite fighter, Anderson Silva. Somehow the word got out and everybody found out that Scott was a SEAL and it, it ended up, you know, Anderson was more impressed with Scott. Last month, Scott was home celebrating his birthday and an early Christmas before heading to Syria. He said he'd be gone for four months. On January 16th, Dave and Fran heard that there had been a deadly bombing in Syria. For years, bombs had exploded near Scott, so they weren't concerned. Then they got a late night knock at their door and Fran thought that someone was trying to break in. I go, don't open the door. Talk through the door. Dave was initially um, confused, but when the woman at the door introduced herself, it became clear. And as soon as she said DA, I'm like, oh my God. And, and Fran's like, what, 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 what? No, no, I, I go, Scott's dead. Since then, it's been a blur. They stood by the president at Dover Air Force Base to greet Scott's body as it landed back in the States. Dave says in that casket is his son and his best friend. And he always said I was his best friend. Dave and Fran say that if Scott had to do life all over again, he wouldn't change a thing. And if they could say one last thing to him, it would be this. Thank you for being in my life. Love you, man. Dave and Fran don't know yet when Scott's body will arrive back here into St. Louis or when the funeral services will be held. Reporting, I'm Catherine Hessel, Fox 2 News. Bob McCullough is a man who doesn't mince words. If it upsets somebody, too bad. And if that somebody is someone close to me who has supported me, too bad. People all over the United States hung on his every word as he announced the grand jury's decision in the Michael Brown case. They determined that no probable cause exists to file any charge against Officer Wilson. But McCullough's story began when his St. Louis City police officer father was shot and killed. One of four kids growing up near Pine Lawn, McCullough was only 12 when his dad died responding to a carjacking. As a high school senior, doctors found a rare cancer in McCullough's leg and had to amputate it two weeks later. They didn't tell me about it at the time, but uh, the survival rate was incredibly low. McCullough graduated from St. Louis University Law School. He spent seven years as an assistant prosecutor before winning St. Louis County Prosecutor in 1991. In effect, my entire uh, legal career has been in the county prosecutor's office. 11 days after taking office, Officer Joanne Liscom was shot and killed. She was a county police officer who was doing a pedestrian check up on Halls Ferry. Um, and a few minutes later, somebody came by and found her shot and laying on the, on the ground on, a, on an incredibly bitterly cold night, the whole time right there. And, uh, and that was a case that, uh, you know, that was a massive case. That was an enormous case. McCullough calls it baptism by fire. Then a few months later, in July of 1991, McCullough charged Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose with inciting the riot at Riverport. 
Headlines read that McCullough chased Rose all over the country, which isn't quite true. I made two phone calls and that was that was it. You know, this was a guy who <clears throat> if all fugitives published their schedule in Rolling Stone magazine and elsewhere, there wouldn't be any fugitives. He picked up the brick and beat this baby with it. McCullough tried cases himself and oversaw his prosecutors. <laughs> On August 9th, 2014, they were thrust into the national spotlight over Michael Brown. And I'm very comfortable in saying that, you know what, I think we handled that incredibly well. We took everything that there was. I mean, that's where the experience kind of kicked in. I mean, I, I'd been in this job for, you know, at that time, 24 years. McCullough says his decisions in that case and for the last 28 years were based on law and not the court of public opinion. And that's why he won't be back for his 29th year. The easiest thing in town and I'd be, you know, getting sworn in again next uh, next few weeks. If I'd have just said, you know, hey, I'm going to recuse myself on this, but there was no conflict there. The oath that I took, actually, which is right here, says you'll support and defend the Constitution and laws of the state of Missouri. Um, and there's no codicil in there that says, well, unless somebody's really yelling at you or you think it might hurt your uh, political career. McCullough doesn't know yet if Ferguson will define his career, but he has done much more than that. He expanded the domestic violence unit in the prosecutor's office, started a drug treatment and veterans court, and made working in the St. Louis County prosecutor's office a career for his team. There are three people leaving the office at the end of the year. We're leaving with 95 years experience in this office, and that's being replaced by three people coming in with essentially zero experience, well not essentially, with zero experience in this office. His advice to his successor is to recognize the talent that he's inheriting. Take full advantage of the experience, the expertise that is here and build upon it. McCullough says when he took office in 91, his main focus was on victims. And as he leaves office, he says that working for them is what he'll miss the most. It's not the presidents that he met or the headlines that he made that he'll remember. It's the notes from victims' parents thanking him. That letter alone, you know, made the 28 years that I've been here worthwhile. Nothing else came along. There was nothing else about it. that letter alone made the 28 years worthwhile. Reporting, I'm Katherine Hessel, Fox 2 News. On May 13, 2019, a man walking near a creek on the 100 block of Jerome smelled something foul. He looked over and he could see what he thought was a body lying face down in the creek. Captain Dennis Plew says the body was Ira Dickerson III, a 37-year-old who stayed at the apartment complex right next to the creek. There had been a big Cinco de Mayo party at that complex and Dickerson had been there. But now police are wondering what happened in the eight days in between the party and when his body was found. We do know from the autopsy and from the, the coroner's report that he had been in the water for three or four days. Mm -hmm. So there's that time, probably like around the 11th, back to the 5th, we don't know what happened. The coroner also found that the cause of death was drowning. So another big question for police is, was this an accident or a murder? Plew says Dickerson was about 6'5", with an athletic build and known to get into fights. Known to be a scrapper. I mean, he was known to get in fights and not back down and, and known to start fights, actually. Detectives talked with the people who Dickerson recently fought with. They admitted to the fight, but said they didn't kill him. Plew says they also explored the theory that Dickerson was intoxicated and stumbled into the creek. But that didn't make much sense either. Around that area, the weeds were so thick and so tall. And like I said, you know, he had no clothing on his lower portion of his body. And we searched through there. We couldn't find anything. There was no chance that when they removed his body from the creek that it came off. Dickerson's mother, Cynthia, says that her son could be headstrong, but he was also very thoughtful. He was my spiritual child. Me and him discussed so many things. Dickerson's body was found the day after Mother's Day, and by the time Cynthia got the call, she already knew it was coming. I never missed the Mother's Day. Call, come, something. And he did nothing, so I, something was wrong. Cynthia believes that her son's death was not an accident, 
Detectives don't know yet, but they're looking for answers. Uh, just, there's a lot of what ifs. We could what if this to death. Maybe he was in an altercation, a fight, somebody knocked him out and then threw him in the water where he could have drowned. Anything that the public could give us to help, because right now, like I said, we've interviewed 20 plus people and it's all led to a dead end. Reporting in Cahokia, I'm Katherine Hessel, Fox 2 News. It's a horrible hell. Karen Mason describes her life as that since her daughter Sarah was shot and killed. Drew says that his sister was a nurturer, generous and giving. Karen says that Sarah was her best friend. She was going to school at um, the community college, St. Charles Community College, for a business degree and she wanted to open a daycare eventually. In October of 2017, 20-year-old 20 Sarah had moved out of her mother's house and into the first place of her own. Two years earlier, Sarah had lost her father unexpectedly to pancreatic cancer. The family was now closer than ever. Now Sarah's new place was still just about a mile from her mom's house. That fall, Sarah was about seven and a half months pregnant. Her having the baby at Christmas time was gonna be just joyful and we were just really looking forward to having an addition to the family. Sarah had named her baby Milani. A baby shower was planned for the Sunday after Halloween. But before the shower came, a true horror story unfolded October 31st. As Karen was headed home from work, she got a call that something had happened at Sarah's house. When she got there, the street was blocked off with crime scene tape. And then an officer started approaching me, so I knew at that point something wasn't good. Sarah had been found by her then boyfriend on the ground, bleeding from the back of her head. Immediately after the discovery, there were some, there were some circumstances found at the scene that really kind of threw out some, some question marks to the, to the uh, officers on the scene as well as to the medical examiner. St. John Police Chief John Morris wouldn't go into detail but says that at the scene the medical examiner couldn't tell if Sarah had fallen, committed suicide, or if they had a homicide on their hands. Forensic evidence uh, was collected at the scene and uh, forensic evidence later determined that it, that it was in fact a homicide. Sarah had been shot in the back of the head. Karen says that Milani lived for an hour and a half after Sarah had been shot, but no one found either of them in time. Now Chief Morris says that from the beginning they had a person of interest. We feel very confident as to who's responsible for this. But it took five weeks to rule the death a homicide, so the scene wasn't initially processed as one and no one was questioned that day. Morris says there are at least three to five people who know exactly what happened to Sarah and her baby and aren't saying anything. There's people out there protecting this person. I have a problem with that. They're here to protect a cold-blooded murderer. Karen says for a year, detectives told her not to tell anyone that her daughter's death was a homicide. Morris says that's because they were trying to build a bigger case. Karen wonders daily if that strategy hurt or helped Sarah and Milani's chances of justice. Her story ended way too soon. Milani was delivered post-mortem. Karen held her and so did Sarah. It's the first time Sarah's holding her baby was in their casket. Now both of their ashes are inside of a light that sits by Karen. It's never been turned off. And Chief Morris says that this case is not cold, closed, or over. Reporting, I'm Katherine Hessel, Fox 2 News.